So this is the second part of the upper lobectomy lung cancer video. The first part covered the anterior lateral thoracotomy to get into the thorax and this part is covering the actual removal of the lung cancer. It's the exact same surgical team as before with Mr Joel Dunning being the chief surgeon and myself James Arkley assisting in the operation. So what Mr Dunning is doing here is he's injecting 10 mils of local anaesthetic into each intercostal space to give an intercostal block from ribs 1 to 12. Um, he started lower down in this operation because the lung cancer had a bit of adhesion at the top which he removes later on but this solution is made up of 60 mils bupivacaine at quarter percent with adrenaline, 10 mils of bicarb to help with acidity and 60 mils of saline. Um, as you can see from the last video the home cells isn't necessarily retracted as much as normal because we do it slowly in order to allow the ligaments to relax a bit rather than to force and crack the ribs open. So as well as injecting the local anesthetic in the intercostal space, it's also probably a good idea to inject some into the phrenic nerve to help with shoulder tip pain and to the vagus to reduce cough. Um, what Mr Dunning is doing here is he's injecting it into the phrenic which you can see there closer to the diaphragm, trying to stay away from the pericardium so that it is a safe procedure. So like we mentioned before, this lady had a good bit of posterior adhesion on the CT scan. So we're just using a long diaphermy there to try and remove the tumour from the chest wall. Um, this is done with a bit of vision, which we could get more of if we open the home cells a bit more. But it's also done with feel as well. And if we thought that invaded into the rib, we would move this operation onto a rib resection. Um, but it came down off the chest wall quite nicely. Um, which is why Mr Dunning was sad we couldn't do it robotically. So now the tumour's down off the chest wall, we can finish off with the intercostal blocks. Um, doing this proximally is best and you can also include the sympathetic chain in this. You can actually see the vertebral bodies uh, to help guide where you're injecting. Um, another good thing to do is alter inject in station 2R4R for the area of the vagus nerve and that helps numb the mediastinum because uh, Mr Dunning thinks that you do get some mediastinal pain after this operation and the final bit where you can inject is the subcarinal station and by doing that you will have maximum pain relief for post-operative pain for these patients because thoracotomies can be very sore to wake up from. So just a bit of chest anatomy here, Mr Dunning was showing off. So this is the phrenic nerve right there, you can see it very nicely running over the pericardium. And then that's the diaphragm down there and up here is the right upper lobe which has got the tumour on it with some adhesion to the lower lobe but not many. So what we've done here is we've just moved the right upper lobe posteriorly using an Allison retractor. It's a, I always think it looks a bit like a fish slice. But anyway, um, so we're just working near the Azagus vein there, which is tracking backwards. And we're just going to start taking out the lymph nodes. You can also see the right main bronchus a bit there. And um, what we're going to do is move above the Azagus. And I'm going to start working out lymph nodes to our forearm. Lifting up the pleura and then going along the Azagus, finding the vagus and then sticking anterior to that. Um, and then that is how you start dissecting these lymph nodes out. So a little interesting point, what we did was we made a port in the anterior part of the chest that we were going to use for the chest drain anyway and we accessed the chest with a stapler through that hole and this is the brand new white load 8mm Medtronic stapler which is considerably smaller than the 12mm um, and we can just use that port really easily without having to make any extra big holes and we're stapling off the right upper lobe vein and preserving the middle lobe vein.
This gives a really nice view into the vessel anatomy of the thorax. So Mr. Dunning's just pointing with a diaphragm here to the main pulmonary artery and uh, above that which he's holding with the forceps now you can see the, the stump of the right upper lobe vein and he's just dissecting mass away. Um, often you'll find posterior to this an ascending second branch which uh, you need to watch out for just in case it bleeds. And then to the right of this you can see the truncal branch of the pulmonary artery uh, otherwise known as the S1, S3 branch. And same again, we're using the anterior port that we made earlier on uh, for all of the stapling and using the 8mm stapler again to staple off the truncal branch of the pulmonary artery. Sadly, due to video time constraints, I couldn't show all of this process, but this is the removing of R11 and just be below the sucker there, you can see the pulmonary artery and we were just dissecting away some of the lymph nodes here. Um, it's not too exciting stuff, so I didn't decide to include all of it in the video. This shows a really good view of a right vagus nerve and how it looks in a person who's alive because typically all the anatomy models you see the vagus nerves this dried up yellowy thing. Um, so we thought it would be quite nice to include that there just for anatomical knowledge. And this was just some more dissecting which was done at the subcarinal station there. And once again I decided not to include it in the video because I thought it would make it too long. So right here we've just got the right upper lobe bronchus uh, held by a right angled retractor and the next stage of the operation is getting rid of this and dissecting the right upper lobe bronchus and once we've done this we'll have done the artery, the vein and the bronchus and we can just have a quick check for if there's any posterior ascending branch and move on to the next part which is uh, making an incomplete middle lobe fissure. Uh, there's a few key parts to this. First of all, when you're angling the staple, you want to look for the middle lobe vein and then make sure the staple is above that so you don't accidentally cut it. Um, you want to know where the tumour is and on this person, the, the tumour is much more posterior to where we're stapling here. So it's not in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe. And you want to make sure you have all of the lymph nodes out at this point uh, just to go along in a nice kind of chronological order. You don't want to leave any lymph nodes in. And when you're angling the stapler out the back parts, which you'll see later on uh, in a couple of seconds, you want to try and aim the stapler towards the top of the right lower lobe, and that way we'll get a nice little fissure created. So this is actually the most important point of the whole video. So this was um, station R2, R4 and you can see the trachea and the superior vena cava. Um, but this packet of lymph nodes were really adherents because she'd had previous mediastinoscopy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So pre-op this was the actual packet of lymph nodes that she tested positive on. Um, and post-op on histology, all of these lymph nodes were negative because of a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. All of the tissue was dead inside there, so the, the cancer was completely removed. Um, so this lady actually went through, she had an endobronchial ultrasound scan, 
then she had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then she had mediastinoscopy, which led to the entire area being extremely adherent, so we spent a lot of time getting it out. But this is actually the most important part of the entire operation, because this was a previous area of positivity for the cancer, and um, you could almost make the argument that removing these positive lymph nodes is more important than removing the cancer itself, because obviously this is how it was spread throughout the thorax. Um, but because on histology it was all negative, it meant that she didn't have to have radiotherapy, which he was very happy about, and it means she has a high chance of clearing it. So the dissection's finished and now what Mr Dunning's doing is he's placing an on cue tunneler in order to put in a catheter to provide a local infusion of anaesthetic for post-operative pain relief. Um, so that's the on cue tunneler there, it's a kind of hard metal blunt ended instrument with a catheter mounted on it and what we're going to do is tunnel all the way under the pleura. And we know from earlier on in the operation that there were some adhesions from the lung cancer, so the pleura will be breached a bit more distal to this. Um, so what we're going to do is come proximal to where the breached pleura is, come a bit closer to the vertebral column. Uh, try and keep the on cue tunnel under the pleura the entire way, and if you do actually breach the pleura, um, what you can do is you can get some Eversell glue or something and kind of just stick it back together because otherwise you'll just have your local infusion of anaesthetic spilling out into the thorax uh, and he's just feeling there with his finger and using a gentle kind of rubbing and turning motion to uh, place the catheter in. The incision was at about the 8th or ninth space and with the tunnel we're trying to get as close as we can to the second or third rib and that way you've got a long infusion of local anaesthetic all the way from the second to the eighth rib providing continuous post-operative pain relief. So it's all been placed there and what you can see is the on cue coming out and the catheter being kind of left behind there and this is going to infuse the pivocane 0.1% at about 10 mils an hour post-operatively just from an on cue bag which we can just kind of keep over arm and then that is the end of the operation we're just placing a chest drain here. So this is actually a bit interesting for a thoracotomy this is a sub xiphoid incision and uh, Mr. Dunning said the reason he does this is he finds people have less pain if you make an incision at this site. And this is actually the hole we've been using the entire operation to fire a staple gun through. Um, so then you don't have to make any extra incisions for staple guns and chest drains. You can kind of just put it all in at once. And um, what we'll just do is put in some water into the chest cavity there. And then we're just doing a, an air leak test. So getting the anaesthetist to inflate the lung and checking for any bubbles from the middle and lower lobes and obviously if there's any bubbling we know there's an air leak but we can see that there's nothing going on there it's all fine we can suck the water out and begin to close up and that will be the end of the operation So the main part of the operation is done and we're, what we're just going to do now is close the thoracotomy. So what we're going to do here is use two number two polysorb braided absorbable sutures um, in a kind of figure of eight to bring the ribs a bit closer together. Uh, Mr Dunning said that he tries to go as far above as he can to avoid the nerve. 
and he said what he used to do was he used to drill a hole in the rib is to completely avoid the nerve because when you're suturing together you don't want to crush the nerve otherwise it will result in post-operative pain however the drills are no longer available and um, the orthopedic team probably nicked them or something um, so these two figure of eight sutures uh, can be tied together and I'll just bring the ribs close together and the key is to not tie them too tightly because if you do that it will result in more post-operative pain than needs be. It's just kind of bringing them together to help them heal um, and the sutures will just absorb away and you'll have nice fixed ribs. So what we're just doing here is we're using a, a a number one polysorb suture to bring serratus anterior back together because obviously you've watched the first video where we did the anterolateral thoracotomy and we cut serratus along the line of its fibers so we're just bringing those fibers back together now nice and gently and we don't need to do anything for latissimus dorsi because we didn't cut it and that was the entire point of the first video for the undermining and creating the flaps in order to not have to cut latissimus dorsi and as a result, we will have a quicker post-operative recovery because we haven't cut through two groups of massive muscles. We've only cut through one smaller group, which is the serratus muscles. So this actually concludes the video now. The rest of it's just uh, closing up the wounds. Um, but some interesting points Mr. Dunning wanted to get across of these two videos were uh, all kind of related to post-operative pain and better ways to do the operation. So first of all, in the anterolateral thoracotomy, we took a lot of time undermining the latissimus dorsi muscles in order to not cut it, um, and that leads to a quicker post-operative recovery. The second thing was spending a bit of time doing the intercostal strip to make sure that the, the nerve running along the rib wasn't crushed by the retractor and that reduces post-operative pain and improves outcomes. The other thing was the intercostal blocks that we did to help with post-operative pain and the sub uh, incision we made, which we placed for a stable gun through the entire time because that site was less post-operative pain and we don't need to make another incision for a chest strain. We just kind of use one hole throughout the entire operation. Uh, and via doing all of this, we've improved outcomes and reduced morbidity in these type of patients.